Coming up, I get my hands on a stone chip keyboard. I play some games. I have a chat to Jeff. I continue with the pretend business. And I end with a typing. Let's get on then. I have reviewed several add-on keyboards for the Spectrum over the years. The popular DK-Tronics version, the Metal Beast that is the Transform keyboard, and the delightful Low Profile, as well as the Saga. There were a few more of course, and I always keep my eye out for them should they pop up on any selling sites. One such keyboard is the Stone Chip keyboard. Adverts started to appear for this around June 1984. It was a compact looking unit with real keys, sold by Stone Chip Electronics for £59.95. There was an earlier advert in November 1983, and the keyboard looked different to all other subsequent adverts. The keys were white, and the controls were different, only having one rotary control at the top left. The advert's selling point, apart from the obvious upgrade from the rubber keys, to a proper full travel one, is that you did not have to open your Spectrum to fit it. The advert even states that your Sinclair warranty will not be affected by using this keyboard. Other features included a full-size spacebar, a built-in amplifier, reset keys, and single keys for things like extended mode and delete. Looking at the advert closely, you'll see that it appears the build quality is not all that good. Some keys are out of line, and some sit lower than others. Not the best image you'd think to advertise your product. When I got mine, the first thing that struck me was the size. Somehow, having had both the DK Tronics and low profile back in the day, and obviously having the others now, I was expecting something a little larger. It's almost the same size as the rubber keyed Spectrum, but just a little deeper, and that's for a good reason. A quick examination of mine showed that it hadn't been used in a long time. The keys were sticky, in that some of them wouldn't move down, and the ones that moved down wouldn't move up, and that sort of thing. This was more evident in keys that were longer, like the spacebar and enter keys. To sort this out, I'd need to get some contact cleaner on them, but first a quick tour, before I try and open it up and see if it all works. At the top on each side are speaker grills. I wonder if there are any actual speakers behind them. We'll find out later. On the top left is a three position switch for load, save and beep, and the beep refers to the amplifier. Top right is a three position switch, allowing you to switch between low, medium and high, and this is either volume or tone. We'll find out later. And in the centre is a small light to indicate power. The keys are laid out in the standard QWERTY fashion, but there are some extra keys here. Top right is a reset key. Now that seems an odd place to put a reset key, as it could be easily hit by accident. Time will tell though, and there's also another reset key in the middle left. Bottom right are extended mode and delete keys, and these offer the function of a single key press to replace multiple key presses to get into extended mode and that sort of thing. But now it's time to get inside, if mine had any screws that is. It came without them, but if it all works, I can get replacements. The bottom part is completely empty, and the top part holds the keyboard itself and an attached circuit board that's used to plug into the Spectrum. The first thing to do though is try and clean these keys. I used WD-40 on this and left it overnight. I didn't want to remove the keycaps because the plastic can get very brittle over the years. The next day I came back to it and the keys were far better. Looking at that speaker grill from the inside, you'll see that one of them's covered over and the other one actually holds a speaker. So not stereo as you'd expect, but just one speaker. Now the full spectrum sits inside the bottom case, and it's a neat idea, but it's very tight. You have to make sure that the small circuit board is pushed in as far as it will go to allow the spectrum to sit down low enough so that the top part of the case can fit on. It does take a lot of messing about, but eventually I got in and it's a really snug fit, which is a good thing I suppose. On the back all the parts are available, except the power socket has now moved next to the video socket. Plugging it in and turning it on and yes, everything works. The power light comes on and you can hear when you press the keys that the beep amplifier is also working. The top reset key does nothing, but it appears if you hold both reset keys down, the spectrum does reset. A good idea to have both then and not just one that you can hit by accident. The size of the keyboard, which is almost the same size as the original rubber keyed version that sits underneath, makes it feel, well, like a spectrum really. The keys are solid, and the legends are printed directly onto the keycaps, which does look a bit more professional. They have a nice sound, and in general, it's a very nice keyboard. 
using it to type letters or enter type-ins feels a lot better. You get much more positive feedback. Playing adventure games too is a good experience. On to normal games then. Let's have a go with Jetpack. Yes, as you would expect, it works. And luckily the beep amplifier is loud enough to almost cover the key clicks. Other games work fine as well, as you would expect. This is a great little keyboard, and it's a good idea that you don't have to start taking your spectrum apart to use it. Now on to that tone or volume control. The original advert had two rotary dials, one for volume and one for tone, but my version has just got this switch. So let's give it a try and see what you think. To my ears, I think it's just changing the tone. In later years, it sold for the same price, so unlike other keyboards, it maintained its original value. A great little keyboard then, and I'm glad I finally got my hands on one. UN Squadron was initially released into the arcade by Capcom in 1989. It was a fast-paced horizontal shooter with different pilots and jets to fly, bonus pickups and nice graphics and sound. The game brought a few different changes to the normal shooter. It had a health bar instead of instant death which allowed the players to get a bit further into the action and hopefully put more money into the machine. And at the start you can choose between three different pilots each having their own ship with different characteristics. A tough game to port for the Spectrum, given the large sprites, smooth scrolling and great sound. This game was released on a compilation called No Limits in 1990, and it came along with Strider 2, and we're going to be looking at both games, but let's start with UN Squadron. Here is the Spectrum version, and straight away we can see the use of monochrome graphics. A bit disappointing really. So many later games did this though. You can choose one of three pilots that sort of look like the originals, but you don't get to see the ship. The game plays music, which is fine, and it's a multi-load, so that means there's a lot of tape rewinding when you want to load a new level, or if you die and have to go back to the start. There's a shop that allows you to buy various weapons, if you have enough credits, of course. And then it's into the game. Well, Monochrome. Mm, it's the only word I can use. The scrolling's a bit slow and jerky in places, and the jet looks, well, less defined than the arcade. I'm sure they could have come up with something better, even in monochrome. Control is slightly sluggish, and where the arcade has two fire buttons for different weapons, the Spectrum just has one. When you get a new weapon, you can use it until it's depleted and then you go back to your previous one. As with the majority of monochrome games, actually seeing the enemy bullets is often impossible, which makes the game frustrating. The difficulty is about the same as the arcade, I felt. I managed to get almost to the exact same place in both before I lost all my energy and died. There are multiple levels, each requiring to be loaded from tape, and each level has a main target, set out with some text at the start. And at the end, there's an end of level boss. In the first level, this is a huge missile launching tank. Level two takes us into the skies, shooting an invisible stealth bomber. Not sure how you would spot one though, but anyway. Here again, we've got monochrome graphics, and even some parallax scrolling, albeit a bit jerky. This level has mini-bosses to battle too, smaller bombers, but eventually you get on to the invisible stealth bomber that isn't invisible at all. Between each level you can buy upgrades as mentioned before, for things like missiles and shields, and then it's on to the next level, 
where you go in search of gun batteries in the forest. On this level it's very tricky to see any ground based targets because of all the trees, so you just have to take a chance and hope you're not going to crash into them if you want to shoot them. This level also has floating mines to avoid. These hang in the sky and float around waiting for you to crash into them. The next level and we have a carrier to take out, but it's in the desert and not the sea. The graphics throughout are very undefined really, and in some cases you can't really see what it's supposed to be. The other levels include a huge bomber, but again the backgrounds look very poor, and it turns out the bomber is a helicopter. There's a missile launcher in a cave, which turns the game into a sort of scramble clone. And the massive launcher isn't even animated at the end, which looks a bit odd. Then there's another bomber, followed by a battleship, and as the arcade goes on it becomes faster and more difficult, but the Spectrum sort of maintains the same sluggish speed. Next you have to take out the Arsenal. No, it's not a football team, but it's a huge tower with multiple guns and lasers. And on to the final battle then, the Project 4 Fortress. This is a huge flying thing, and reminds me of one of the levels in R-Type, where you fly over and under a large spaceship, taking out various gun turrets. Overall the sound's a bit poor really. The tune plays, but the only sound effect you get, apart from the odd beep when you collect a collectible, is white noise for firing and explosions. There really needs to be a bit more variation. The game does include most of the arcade features though, which is to be commended, but the graphics are, well, a bit of a letdown. They look digitised rather than actually drawn by an artist, and this gives them a dithered look which doesn't really suit the game at all. Gameplay is fine, with there's lots of action and shooting, but there still remains the issue of not being able to see the enemy bullets. A good overall game then, but it could have been so much better. Next we come to Strider 2, and this is a bit of a mystery. The arcade game was released in 1999, but the Spectrum version was released in 1990. How could that be? Well, it seems the developers were not really happy with the first game, and so updated it and improved it, and pushed out this new version. At this point, the real arcade version of Strider 2 was probably not even being worked on, so this isn't a version of that, it is instead an improved version of the first game. Onwards then, and the hero from the first game returns, to find he's now needed on another planet. The planet Magenta needs him to rescue a female leader that has been kidnapped, and to help him they have given him some nice new weapons, a high velocity gyro laser and a matter converter that when charged will give him a mech suit. There are five levels to this game and we start in the forest. The main character is well drawn and well animated, and we get some colour, and it looks really good. Yes, there's colour clash, but this is a spectrum. You can fire your laser or use your trusty sword to get rid of plants. Yes, I said plants. Chasing enemies and other things that are intent to stop you. There are lifts to move up and down on, and they're easy to get onto, unlike other games that have lifts. The graphics throughout are really nice, I think, and the gameplay is smooth and fast. It plays well, and although not a fan of this style, I can appreciate the overall concept and action. I enjoyed it the more I played it, with cheats of course, so I could get to see all of the game, or most of it. Sound is used well with some good spot effects, and I am starting to like this game. Much more fun than UN Squadron. The wall climbing mechanic works really well, and there are ropes and chains that can be used to climb up as well. These are used in later levels and must be used to make progress, so they're not just something the developers have thrown in. Some thought has gone into using these. The game map is large and varied, but I think this would be challenging without some kind of cheat. The enemies come at you constantly, and some of them are almost impossible to avoid. 
Overall, this is a really nice game, and the one that I didn't think I would like. If you like Strider, or if you thought Strider could be improved, then give this a try. This is Blocks, released in 2020 by Raymond Russell. Now I know it's not brand new, but I haven't seen it before. Anyway, you can grab it from his website as a digital download, or if you want the real thing, here is the tape version, also available from his website. Blocks is a nice little puzzle game that really gets the brain cells working. The idea is that you have to get the blocks next to each other so they can be removed from the screen but the blocks can only be moved in the direction of the arrow on top. Using this, you need to make two or more blocks touch to get rid of them. Gradually things get harder with different screen layouts that block certain paths, and you have to work out the best way to complete each level. And not only that, each level has a time limit too, so you can't hang around. Once you complete a level, you can resume from that place if you want to carry on trying to get through it. There are several nice tunes that play throughout that really suit the game. A great little puzzles game then, and well worth loading up for a bit of chilled out brain teasing. So Paul, today we're going to talk about a subject that you brought up, which is the defacement of magazines and cassette inlays and things like that. Yeah, I thought about this when I got a recent batch of magazines, and as I flicked through them, some of them had things cut out. So, you, you know, there was bits of adverts cut out, there was bits of competition entry forms cut out, and there were bits of uh, pages randomly cut out, and I don't really know why. I think some of them were screenshots, but I don't know why you'd cut a screenshot out. And it got me thinking, did I ever deface a magazine? Did I ever deface a game? And also during one of the recent uh, games I was reviewing on the show, I noticed that somebody had written a poke on the back of the inlay. So I was, I was just wondering, did everybody do that? And, and have you ever done it? I don't think I ever did it. I can't recall ever doing it. The only thing I can remember is in my original Lords of Midnight manual, there was a bit in the back that you could write in and cut out and send into Beyond, and I think I said, I think this is the most wonderful, brilliant game ever. Okay. We're only we're only a few seconds into this, and I've already brought up Lords of Midnight. I know it's amazing. You've got this strange talent for doing it. Some of these magazines I found one I've got, which is Sinclair Programs. It looks like it was taken to school by a 10 year old mm. and they've just defaced it and they've put a lot of racist comments in there and they've also written the names of I'm assuming either teachers or pupils that look like the artwork against the thing I'll try I'll try and show as much as I can without getting into trouble um, and that's a bit of a shame really because I mean obviously they thought they were going to use it and throw it away and never see it again yeah. but somehow 40 years later it's turned up in, in in my room and I'm looking at it thinking why why would you scribble on a magazine yeah why would you do that Unless it was somebody else's magazine and someone got a hold of it and decided to deface it at school. Maybe, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, to be honest, the only time I've actually written in a magazine was when I was doing typings and I either found a bug or I had to stop halfway through. So I put a little line on it to say I was there. And strangely enough, as if history was repeating, I got a batch of magazines from 1978. And somebody was, the owner was typing out a listing for some really old computer and they had done exactly the same. They'd put a little mark in saying this is an error um, for correction C issue, whatever. Yeah, I could imagine people doing that. Another thing that people probably don't consider to be defacement, but a lot of magazines and scans have got the name of the person written on the top and that was because the news agent used to reserve it for you. A lot of my crash magazines had my, uh, had my address as it was way back then at the yeah. top of them, yeah. 
So I, I don't know if I mean it's not defacement by the owner, but you know it does ruin the cover. It does ruin the cover. Actually, if we're talking about Crash, Crash defaced one of their own editions, didn't they? Un- uncle- was it unclear user that did? Yeah. Or is that what you're talking? And they ripped about? the pages yeah. out. Why? It took ages and ages for that to come. There was an injunction; they had to do it. Uh, and when I got it, I remember I think they just ripped out a lot of the pages of all these magazines before they could be. So they implied somebody just to sit and rip the pages out. Yep, yeah, someone must have had to do it. But the pages, <laughs> the pages in the one that I got were actually ripped out. What about what about games then? Did you ever write on games? Or like I said, I've got a couple of games where people have written um, infinite life pokes, and I've got one game where whoever had it has, has corrected the inlay because the inlay gave certain keys to control the game, and they've written. Um, a different set of keys. The only thing I can ever recall is on my Bug Bite Manic Miner writing 6031769, which is the right, thing yeah. that you type in to be able to warp to different screens. I think it was my cousin had Escape from Krakatoa, and he wrote, he wrote the keys in the inlay because they weren't actually in the inlay. They were only on a screen in the game that you had to wait quite a while to get to once the game had loaded up. And there were a lot yeah. of keys for that game. I suppose you can you can look at it in two ways. You can think this is defacement and it shouldn't be you know shouldn't be tolerated. But on on the other hand, you can look at it and think, who was this person? What were they doing at the time? They were obviously involved in the game because they wanted to put a poke in or they wanted to get the right keys. So it it must have been um, used quite a lot rather than you know rather than defacing just for the fa- uh, for the yeah. sake of it. I think I knew some people who would certainly on one side of the tape, actually merge the loader, put some pokes in, and then re-record that loader over the start of the tape, hoping not to hit the machine code section on the tape. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, because a lot of the magazines sort of published small typings that um, entered pokes and things. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's kind of defacement in a different way. You're actually defacing the game itself because you're putting pokes into it. <laughs> I did once accidentally save a saved game over somebody else's tape and then give it back to them, and he weren't very happy. <laughs> Craig Douglas, if oh. you're listening, which you probably know, I'm sorry. So I'd be interested to know if anybody else defaced magazines and tapes, or or even what they think of it, because I'm sure lots of people have got magazines and tapes in their collections, and I'm sure if they look deep enough, they'll find some pen marks and scribbles and things. So I think that wraps it up, doesn't it? Um, I think that wraps it up. Did anyone deface anything? Magazines, cassette inlays, the tapes themselves? And if so, what were you thinking? In previous episodes, you've seen me setting up a fictional company selling Spectrum games. I have bought and set up the hardware, selected suppliers, set up stock systems, a word processor, an order tracking system, and now it's time to advertise. The games have arrived, hurrah, so they now need adding to the stock system. Once loaded, I just select the number relating to the stock item and enter the new stock level. This does take a bit of time, however. A quick look on screen and it's all done. Now I need to sell them, and to do that, I need to advertise. Back to the word processor and a few letters to magazines asking about advertising rates, and I eventually settle on a quarter page advert in Crash Magazine. Now then, I need to make the advert. I made this draft on my PC as a rough idea. So this is what I'm looking to produce. Obviously, I'll need something with large fonts, lines, maybe a bit of shading. All basic things, really. For this, I'm going to use an art package. And there are many to choose from. Melbourne Draw, Leonardo, Icon Graphics, Paintbox, OCP Art Studio, The Artist, and many more. It needs to be microdrive compatible, though. And as we've seen, this isn't always straightforward. I'll start with Leonardo. Looking through the manual, it did not mention anywhere that it was MacDrive compatible. It did, however, point to a basic section in the program that allowed you to save out a copy. Looking at the listing, it probably would be possible to change it to save to disk, but impossible to set the program to save data afterwards. I then moved on to Icon Graphics, and on the back of the box it claims MicroDrive compatibility. We may be in luck. The instructions say to load a program called gmicro, and this will save a microdrive version of the program. Excellent! Let's try it then. Well, yes it works. Loading the program, and the control is very off-putting. 
hitting space or anything on the bottom row by accident stops the program and drops you back into basic and this loses all of your work. After trying to make an advert for about 10 minutes, I hit space about six times and lost all my work. Very, very frustrating. I think I'll try another program. Let's try Melbourne Draw. Now this does not mention microdrives anywhere in the manual, but I know it can work because Ocean Software had a modified version they used themselves and that was stored on microdrive. Anyway, once loaded, you can actually break into the basic part and yes, you could possibly change the code to work with microdrives. However, before I actually started to do that, I tested it out and well, it, it lacked a few things I was looking for. I wanted larger text characters in my advert and I also wanted to use a different fill pattern, possibly. Anyway, moving on, the next one was Paintbox, a package I had back in the day, mainly for creating multiple banks of user-definable graphics. Looking through the manual though, it did not mention microdrives again, and it only offered a solid fill. Okay, I think I'll leave this. Next is OCP Art Studio. Now this had all the things I needed, and more. Textured shading, large fonts, and even the ability to load your own fonts. But would it go onto microdrive? Uh, no. But in the instructions it mentions another version of the program called Extended Art Studio that works with microdrives. I couldn't find this. There's an advanced art studio for 128k machines, but nothing called Extended, at least as far as I could see. Later in the manual it says it's on the same tape, but all of the tape images I found online didn't have it. The cover states it comes with the extended version too, but I just can't find it and I didn't want to start loading up the real tape. So it's time to move on. The last package I tried is the Artist 2 from Soft Technics. Straight into the manual and I see there's an option to save files to microdrive. Excellent! But nothing tells you how to actually save the program to microdrive. Hmm. If you merge the loader, you could probably save it onto disk if you knew the length of the machine code. And you could get that from any emulator really, but I didn't really want to start messing about. In the end, I went for the easy way out, the plus D snapshot button. This allowed me to save the whole program to disk at the point I'd normally run it. Now it's time to try and make a nice advert. First let's see what fonts it comes with. Not a very wide selection, but you can load your own in. Now I had to try and copy, or get as near as I could, the one I produced earlier. So I can swap a few fonts in and out, choose a bold font, and add the title and strap line to my company. This was very slow. You have to select the text item, you have to move the cursor to where you want the text to start, you select start text, you write the text, and then you stop writing text. Mm, all very slow and cumbersome, but eventually it does work. I then needed to add a border around it. This was a bit troublesome until I actually read the manual, and eventually I got a square border. Now adding the address, and I can start putting the things in. Let's start with a special offer on Jetpack ROM. Not easy to align perfectly really, but I can get it there nearly. The next offer was on Games Designer, but I didn't have enough space as you can see. Oh dear. Then I can start adding the games. And eventually I have something that almost looks like the advert I started with. Okay, now let's try and print it out then. This program has an option for ZX printer and 80 column printers if you have a Kempston printer interface. It also offers various grayscale options. But just for now I want black and white, so let's try it on the ZX printer. Ah, nothing. No output, no nothing. Hmm, okay. Let's try setting it up for a Kempston printer. Oh, no, you can't even set Kempston. It just comes up with an error. Right, there's only one option left then. I reload the advert in, view the screen, and using the snapshot button, I can dump the thing out to printer. Well, that took a lot longer than anticipated, and it doesn't look really good, to be honest. I think it would probably be far easier to either hand draw it, and yes there were hand drawn adverts back then, or just explain what I want via a word processor so that people can do it themselves in the magazine. Right then, Whew. running a business isn't all it's made out to be.
The game this time is called Apples. Well, at least in the magazine, which is Popular Computing Weekly, from May 1983. However, looking at the listing, it's actually called Scrumping. The listing covers two pages, but in reality, if you put them together, it would cover one. It looked easy enough to type out, and the print was readable, so I thought I'd give it a try. Once complete and the first run, as expected, caused issues. The graphics were not being set up properly, and that was just a typo. Also, the main character was not in the right place. Yes, another typo by myself. The next attempt to run it produced a scroll message, so something was trying to print too low down the screen. The third attempt, and this time I had to intervene to make sure the messages at the bottom of the screen were cleared. Eventually, though, we got there and we can play the game. The story is on the screen. It's about two boys who want to go steal apples from an orchard. But it's basically a random object catching game, but nicely presented. Apples drop down in front of the wall and you have to move around and catch them before they hit the floor. Once you collect a certain number, a platform is added underneath, meaning you have less time to do this. The game also has an interesting feature. It has a self-running demo. If you don't start the game for a period of time, the demo begins and it plays itself. That's a nice feature for a typing game. This is probably the first time it's been seen since 1983, and it will be free to download from my website very soon. <laughs>